This is our college. Though it lies close to the centre of Oxford, its quadrangles are an island of peace in the sea of city streets. Its stone walls have grown, altered and aged from the 16th century onwards as the college has expanded to serve the needs of its community of students. This is the first quadrangle, containing the chapel, the principal's lodgings, the dining hall, the buttery and the kitchens. Beyond the hall stretch the second and third quadrangles, whose many staircases lead to the rooms in which we live. As students have returned from war service, the college is crowded. Some of us have to share rooms, others live in the town. The quadrangles are enriched by many lively stone carvings, among them a fine head copied from a portrait in the hall. The college library has a notable collection of early Welsh literature, reflecting the long and continuous connections between the college and Wales. We come together for our meals in the 17th century hall. Many portraits hang on the panelled walls, including the one of Hugh Price, our founder and first benefactor, and another of Queen Elizabeth, who gave her support to his plans. One of our most famous students was Lawrence of Arabia. The Welsh traditions of the college were developed by Edmund Meyrick, who established a number of Welsh scholarships in the 18th century. Day begins when the scout knocks on the door. While breakfast is ready at quarter past eight, most of us are ready a little later, and last minute arrivals keep the chef busy. Undergraduates' appetites and temperaments are ill-suited to post-war rationing. The day ahead is a busy one. Though we live here together in one college, we study many different subjects. Our lectures may be given in any of the other colleges of Oxford. If we are not going to a lecture or to a seat in a packed library, there is always mail to collect or books to find. For lectures and tutorials, we must wear our black gowns. These tutorials play an important part in our study. We never arrive quite on time, especially at nine o'clock in the morning, but one's tutor is usually long-suffering and patient, both in this and in other matters. Very often things become more difficult as one reads one's weekly essay, for the argument that seemed all right when it was written the night before may startle you in the cold, clear light of morning as much as your tutor. But tutors are used to it. And they have a sense of humour. Lectures are not compulsory. Some prefer to read for themselves rather than to listen and take notes. But a good speaker always attracts a crowd and audiences usually overflow onto the floor. An hour's lecture calls for a good deal of writing, listening and concentration. Concentration calls for relaxation. Here also there is plenty of company and in a cafe one can rest and talk for oneself. In the afternoon, there are no lectures, so one has time to work alone. Or to try to work. Or to give up working altogether. There are many ways of keeping fit, be they strenuous or leisurely. Fine athletes gain experience in college teams. And in the summer, eights week is the climax of the season's rowing, and the college races on the Thames are a picturesque reminder of the equally important Oxford-Cambridge boat race. Tea is an important matter for the Englishman, and the Oxford undergraduate observes the ceremony with all due reverence. We approach the problem in three distinct ways. The studious tea, 
is a triumph of mind over matter. The social tea holds the forces neatly in balance. But tea a la Oxford is really down to earth. The evening dinner is the formal event of the day. The principal and dons cross in order of seniority from their common room to the hall. We all wear our appropriate academic gowns and for the occasion the tables are laid with the priceless college silver. The principal signals to the senior scholar to recite grace. Nos miserete gentes homines pro quibo, quem in aluminium corpus sanctificat omnibus eis largitus, ut eo utama grati tibi deus omnipotens peticalis disgratias reverenta agamus, simul obsecrentes ut quibum angolorum, verum panem calestum verbum dei aeternum, dominum nostrum Jesum Christum nobis impetiaris, ut ele mens nostra pescatu et percanem et sanguinem eos foviama alame corroborema. Amen. In the evening we have a rigorous code of behaviour. The senior commoner at the head of the table is responsible for seeing that this is observed. If a rule is broken and the offender has no valid excuse, he is requested by the senior commoner to bring in a sconce for which he must pay. The bad news is passed on to him down the table by word of mouth. The offender signs his own sentence, which is fortunately nothing more lethal than a quart of beer in a special silver tankard known as a sconce. If he can empty the sconce at one draught, then the senior commoner is himself obliged to order a quart. But if the offender fails, the tankard is passed round the table for others to share. Hmm, some of us are more thirsty than others. The social side of our college life is as important as the academic. In the junior common room we hold regular meetings presided over by an elected president and committee. In this way we manage our own affairs to a very great extent. We discuss anything concerning us as students inside or outside our college life. The rough and tumble atmosphere is nevertheless friendly and disciplined. Many of us learn to rise to our feet for the first time to acquire an experience and confidence of lasting value. But however heated the argument, the final decision is by voting. We live together as a community in which each can play his part. So in the evening after dinner there are many different attractions. There are concerts for the musical and clubs for the intellectual. All tastes are satisfied, be they political, academic or largely mild and bitter. College life is so full and varied that one has little time to realize how much the elusive yet penetrating atmosphere of seclusion, learning and tradition shapes our personality. But behind the hard work, the sentiment and the romance there lies a deeper experience. The lights burn late each night round the quadrangles. As the pages turn, the pens jerk and scratch into the young hours of the morning. The coffee cups lie cold and empty and the ashtrays fill. The shadows and anxieties of examinations approach each summer, 
then pass for a while as the solemn quadrangles of the college are transformed into a romantic setting for the commemoration ball. For one night in the year, dancing feet, gay dresses and the carefree rhythm of the dance replace the tolling bell, the black gown and the musty smell of second-hand books. The year is over. Once more some of us leave and others arrive. Freshmen explore the ancient rooms and quadrangles. Some of us will become statesmen and diplomats or businessmen, authors, artists and bishops. Others will be scientists and research workers, doctors, teachers and civil servants. But wherever we go, whatever we do, we will share the same memories of college life. Memories of which this film is a record. <laughs> 